a poor lumberjack. <laughs> now, that's not a Bible term. That's my term. <laughs> but you'll see it fits in our chapter. A poor lumberjack. 2 Kings chapter 6, we'll begin in verse 1 down to verse 7. He says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha. Now Elisha has come on the scene, of course, after Elijah. And Elisha does twice as many miracles as what Elijah did. And this is, uh, he's been doing one after the next. And here's the next in a series. And this is the sons of the prophets. They got a college going, a little Bible institute. And so he's teaching these guys that obviously they'd outgrown their facility. And they say this to him. Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. You want to do it? Go for it. <laughs> Verse 3. And one said, Be content, I pray thee. And go with thy servants. And he answered, I'll go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. Had a plan and they proceeded with it. Verse 5. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he answered him uh, and he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take up to thee, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it up. Marvelous event. Here this axe head comes flying off, gets lost in the water. The Jordan is a river that flows. It's not stationary. So this is, you know, that's quite a feat for it to swim through the current to the man. Uh, this is something that'll blow your mind. I heard somebody say, the way, you know, they always try to explain miracles away. I like this one. The guy said, the man who made, or the, the person who made gravity could also reverse gravity. And he turned the reverse on and the iron came to the surface and he said, get moving, and it started swimming. <laughs> That's a good explanation for it. <laughs> Look at Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 22. In our story, we've got a poor lumberjack. All the boys got together and decided we're going to go down to the Jordan, and we're going to cut down some wood there, and we're going to build us a, a, a college. Well, one guy looks at the other guys, and they've all got axes, and he says, i got to join the party. I better go borrow one. So he borrows an axe. And that's the one that comes flying off. Proverbs 22, verse 7, he says, The rich ruleth over the poor. Haven't you found that to be so? And the borrower is servant to the lender. Hmm. When you borrow something, it's not yours. <laughs> and you are servant to the lender. You're responsible to him for what you got from him. In Romans 8, verse 12, the Bible says this, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. If you're saved, you are in debt. Hmm. And you know what we learned about the debtor? He's a servant to the lender. Did God give you life? Yes, it wasn't yours. You didn't create it. Therefore, you're in debt and you're a servant to God. A double servant. <laughs> he made you, and now he gave you life. In uh, verse 13, he says this, If you live after the flesh, you shall die. That is, if you want to be rebellious about this thing, then you'll die. Mm. That's pretty harsh, <laughs> but that's true. He says, If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. That is, he puts some criteria on this loan that he gave you. He gave you life, and he says, with this life, I intend you to do this and this. If we loan someone something, we have the right to do that. You can say, I'm loaning you this, but don't do this with it, and don't do that with it. You can take it for this long, but then return it. God gave us life. He has the right to put some stipulations on it, and he does. 
Now we'll return to our text here, and I'm just going to go through it as quickly as possible. I'm not going to give you a whole bunch of cross-references. Y'all know enough Bible that you can start putting your own in there. And I'll let God make the applications, and I'll just read you the story. It's a good one. In verse 2, I notice a plan. He says, Take thence every man a beam. So all of them have come together, and they said, uh, one of them maybe have been, have, have, may have been an architect. That's uh, 2 Kings, 2 Kings 6 and verse 2. They come up with a plan. They're going to do this. Now, with this plan that they had, it's ingenious because you only need one tool, an axe. You know, in this life, you only need one tool. It's the book you've got in your lap. The one who created this whole universe has given you one thing that'll guide you through this life, the word of God. And you need that word of God, but guess what? Not everybody is proficient with the word of God. Sometimes you got to borrow it. <laughs> That's what we do when we listen to messages. That's what we do when we study what other men have said. Doesn't mean the other men are God, but we're borrowing brains. I like what uh, uh, Bob Jones Sr. said. He said, brains can be borrowed. Truth has to be revealed. That's true. You can borrow somebody else's brain and find out what they know. And then you ask God, is there any light in that? And then he'll turn on the light or he'll say, nope, there wasn't any in that. Sounded good, but there wasn't nothing there. <laughs> in uh, John 6, verse 63, the Bible says this. It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The words, plural, that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. That's the one tool we need, his words, plural. And we've already discussed it. You need all of them. <laughs> you don't need a book that only has part of them because they're trying to manipulate you. In 68, the Bible said this, John 6, 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And that's true. You won't go anywhere else and find any words better than right here. The words, the one tool that'll get you through all the messes we get into <laughs> is this book right here. Now, our poor lumberjack runs into the same thing we do in life. I call this problem number one, <laughs> meaning there's going to be a list of them. <laughs> in your life, there will be two. Problem number one was he had to borrow an axe. He didn't have his own. Now, this is, this is okay. There's no reprimand given to him for borrowing it. You'll find some people that are against borrowing anything. And they say, no, no, you save up and you never get a loan and you never do. Well, that's not according to the Old Testament. Over and over, God built a whole nation based on borrowing. <laughs> he said, go to the Egyptians and tell them you want to borrow something. And then just rob them blind. <laughs> now I'm exaggerating but they did start by borrowing here the man has borrowed if ever there was a good opportunity to preach a sermon against borrowing Elisha sure missed it <laughs> but he didn't you're going to have to borrow at times because you are a servant of servants that's just the way you are Paul said that was his job was to serve in 1 Corinthians 4 7 the Bible says this for who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? <laughs> Guess what? Every message, every sermon that means anything is plagiarized from one book, the Bible. We preach a message not because we have a message that we made up. We preach messages God made up. Otherwise, it's a mess. A lot of people preach a mess, but not a message. There's a difference. <laughs> uh, the, our, our, we'll be back in our text. We'll stay in our text. That was that verse I was uh, 4 7, 1 Corinthians 4 7. I'm moving fast. We've only got 10 points today. Uh, <laughs> the next thing I'll see in our text in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 4, he says, they cut down wood. They had a plan, and now they're going to work their plan. It's working. They went out there, and they started chopping down trees. That's good. That's what you wanted to do. They wanted to build something. They had to get active. 
They went out and they chopped down some trees. Everything goes according to plan. The tests in life don't show up in the planning stage or even the initial starting usually. It's until you start working the program that you start finding the flaws in it. (laughs) Here, the man with the borrowed axe was just as productive as those who had invested in buying their own axes. It looked like they were all doing the same thing. You'll find this. You can borrow some brains. You can learn some doctrines and then parrot it like a parrot, but not really know it. And then when the metal hits a knot in the tree, you suddenly find out if your axe is connected to the stick. (laughs) And this is true. That's why the axe needs to become your axe. You've got to study that word and study that word until you can handle it without it being shaky. As a matter of fact, this man with the borrowed axe worked a whole lot harder with his axe than the owner had. A lot more zeal was put out of the poor lumberjack than the owner because the owner still had the axe head on it. Had the owner been working as hard as the lumberjack, there wouldn't be a head connected to the stick. When that guy got a hold of it, he was swinging it so hard that that head just come flying off just like David does when he gets him a mallet. He swings that thing so hard that it just smashes it. Smithereens. (laughs) That's right. Thor or something. Oh. Now we're going to come to the next stage of our program. Verse 5, the first word says, but. That is, everything was going along pretty good until we got to this point. I call this problem number two. (laughs) You'll hit that crucial stage. When the disguise of fame and fortune fades, the you that appears is the you you were all along. Now, this is what the man's going to realize. Hey, I'm back to who I really am, a man without an axe. (laughs) That's who he was to begin with. He borrowed the axe so it looked like he had one. Now it's been revealed. He really is standing there with just a stick in his hand. (laughs) Now, he was smart enough that he didn't try to start wailing on the tree with just the handle. That would have done no good. We got a bunch of people in Christendom that do that. They have just barely milk toast and they're going to wail on people with it as though that's going to do any good. You need some sharp point on it. You know, the Bible's supposed to be convicting. You're supposed to read it. You're supposed to hear a message and go away thinking, ooh, I need to change that or that hurt. It should do that. That's what an ax does. It's got a sharp point. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're just beating somebody with a stick. (laughs) The poor lumberjack was wise in that he did not use his leftover handle to try to replace what was powerful to begin with. An axe is not an axe if it doesn't cut. (laughs) you could call it something else. You could call it a hammer. But if it doesn't cut, it ain't an axe. The next thing I'll see in verse 5 is this. He says, alas. Now, that's not flippantly. That's pain in those words, or that word. He's saying, everything has fallen apart. I've come to the end of the rope. I had to borrow the axe to get here. I got here and just began making uh, productivity. And look where I am now. I'm farther behind than when I began. He borrowed the axe. He broke the axe. He's got to return to the master, owing him an axe and whatever he had laid down to borrow. Way behind. Sometimes you feel like that. He's got an eye toward one day I owe an explanation to the man who loaned me the axe. 
There's accountability here. That's missing in our age nowadays, is that you are accountable. Our story should have ended here if he was an American. <laughs> the American would have said, nothing's working out. It's all failed. I borrowed it. It fell apart. It ain't my fault. <laughs> you had a defective axe. <laughs> yes. Yes. You should have known that before you gave it to me. That ain't my fault. He's not stopped here, though. He's gone the next step. He goes to Elisha and says, I need help. You know, there's going to come a time when you're studying, when you're working, and you hit a brick wall. And it feels like you got no more answers. Uh, God has not revealed any more to you. Well, unless you've asked, you've not done all you can do. And I tell the kids they're doing this and they can't get this accomplished or can't get that accomplished. I say, well, you've not tried all you can try until you ask me for help. Okay. So sometimes you got to ask for help. The man lost his axe. Now, don't you think he had already done what he could do to find it? Sure. He looked around. The axe was head was gone. Now he's depressed. He didn't stop with depression. Depression will stop you in your tracks if you let it. You got to ask. You got to use your eyes and you got to use your feet. And sometimes you got to use your mouth. Help me. Somebody else do something. I can't do any more. Here's the response. Verse six. Elisha says, where fell it? Don't you hate that response? I lost it. Where'd you lose it? If I knew that, I'd already had it. <laughs> Fact of the matter is this. That's a good question. Isn't that the natural question you respond to when somebody says, I lost something? You say, well, where? Okay, we're not going to go searching at the man's house with whom you borrowed it from. We know it's not there. It's wherever you were using it that you lost it. Usually, when our life loses what makes it powerful, you should question, where did the power stop? Okay, let's go back to that spot. We'll begin there. Usually, not, God's not going to reveal new truth to you until you do what you were supposed to with the last one he gave you. And if you dropped it there, you go back there and you pick it up. And now you're back on track. Sounds simple. <laughs> Everything that's lost has to be found in the spot you lost it. It's so simple, yet so complicated. <laughs> the next thing I notice in verse 6, I call the place. He says in verse 6, and he showed him the place. Man says, well, I was working right here. He doesn't say I was working over there in, you know, the north country. No, he took him right to the spot where he was working. No cover-up, no excuse. He simply says, this is the tree I was working on. I was standing right here and I was swinging like this. Now he's demonstrated it. Someone else can have a second opinion of what's going on. Sometimes we need that in life. Sometimes you say, look, here's the situation was like this. I've been doing this. I've been reading this. I heard this. Lay it all out there and get a second opinion. Sometimes it's good to have a second opinion. You know, you've got 66 books worth of second opinions. Get God's opinion on what's going on. He'll tell you. Now you show him the place. God already knows, but he likes to hear it from you. You can tell him. Look, I'm not hiding any of this mess. You've already seen it. Here's what's going on. This is where I was. This is what I think I need. Show me the answer. Now, sometimes he'll show it to you, and sometimes he'll do what this guy did. Next thing I'll notice, I call a picture. In verse 6, verse 6, this is not the demonstration I want to see. Think about it. The man's got an axe. He borrowed the axe. He's been working so hard and with such zeal, he's knocked the head off of the thing. Mr. Answer Man shows up and says, okay, where did you lose it? Well, he didn't know that either, you know, or he would already had it. 
He says, let me show you something. Let me show you what you should have done. Don't you hate to hear that? You should have. Now, let's put ourselves in the picture. I can see Elisha. He says, okay, you showed me where it is. Now, I'm going to show you something. He reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out a pocket knife, and he cuts off a stick off of a tree. That ain't the same as chopping down a tree. <laughs> That's what he did. He says, and he cut a stick. You know, it's a lot easier to cut a stick than it is to chop down a tree. But yet, that was the illustration given. You know why? Man's using too much of flesh to get his tree chopped. You know, a tool is a tool because it does not require as much manual force. Otherwise, we wouldn't have tools. Tools inherently have a job that they can do, you can't. Now, we've got a tool, the Word of God. It doesn't require so much effort on our part to manipulate the outcome. We simply use it as God intended, and He'll get the outcome. It doesn't take a whole lot of stress and strain to cut down a stick with a pocket knife. Elisha is showing him, hey, look, here's the picture. You simply use the tool for its intended purpose. Don't force it. The answer was less impressive than the work of a lumberjack felling trees. <laughs> now, we've seen this over and over. You remember Gideon's 300. God says, no, we're not going to do it with the great big force. Man would think they, get, they became powerful. Simple. At the, the Jordan... Nahum came down, and he was supposed to take a bath. He says, that's a muddy, ugly river. I don't want to get in there. <laughs> okay, God uses the simple things. You've got a tool. It's pretty simple. It's complex, but it's simple. <laughs> Read it and use it the way God intends it. Now, by that, I mean don't manipulate it. I know we want certain outcomes, I know there is these people who preach in um, if God is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all, and you want to preach that because you want Christians to clean up their life. However, it's not Bible. <laughs> when you become God, you can write you a Bible. Until then, shut up and use his the way he intends it to be used. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> God's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. Use your mighty axe just like you would a pocket knife. It has an intended meaning and purpose. Don't manipulate it. Now, the next thing I'll notice or the last thing is in verse 7. He says, take it up. He didn't tell him how to get it. He just said, go get it. <laughs> the axe came to the surface and started swimming and he says, go get it. Now, I don't know how, how he had to go get it. Maybe he had to swim out there and meet it. Maybe the thing swam halfway and he had to fight the current and go get it. Maybe the thing swam all the way up to the bank and he had to go pick it up. But we do notice this. Elisha doesn't offer to attach it back for him. Elisha doesn't say, go hand it to me and I'll take care of it. You watch me chop this one down and you'll know how to do it. No. Lesson's over at that point. You got to get busy doing something now. Miracle is done. Don't get in a welfare line. <laughs> God will answer your problems. But then don't start stomping your feet and saying, I need more miracles. You know, I'm just wore out from what you just did. I mean, I'd be kind of wore out. Mentally and physically, this guy's been through it. <laughs> I mean, think about it. He borrowed the axe. He lost the axe head. Now he's doubly behind, and now Elisha's making fun of him with a pocket knife. <laughs> then all of a sudden, he sees a piece of iron come up from inside the river there and start swimming toward him. He's blown away mentally, but now physically, too, because he's been working so hard, the head came off to begin with. Elisha doesn't say, you go on vacation, you've done enough. He says, go get it. Let's get back to work. <laughs> In conclusion, Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs 13, verse 11. Proverbs 13, verse 11. 
one of the first blessings that God gave man in the garden was a word we don't like, W-O-R-K, work. Now, I know there's different kinds of work. You should always be working. Even if it's not physical, you should be mentally working. Um, that keeps you young, even though you feel old. <laughs> However, there's always something to be done. He says in Proverbs 13, verse 11, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Nothing wrong with work. God has just performed a miracle. The lumberjack got back what he had lost. But now it simply puts him back to work, not on a speaking tour. <laughs> that would be modern America. Now he's going to, you know, go out and bill himself as the man who can make uh, iron swim. <laughs> no, it wasn't him. It was God. And when God performs a miracle, the miracle doesn't suddenly become God. God's still God, whether he decides to do a miracle or not. Look down at verse 23, Proverbs 13, 23. Proverbs 13, 23. It says, much food is in the tillage of the poor. That just doesn't sound right, does it? He says they're poor. Okay, we recognize who poor people are. He says, much tillage is, uh, much food is in the tillage of the poor. That is, when the poor will get out there and work, he'll get a lot of food. Still be poor, though. <laughs> you know, some people God intends to stay poor all their life. That's okay. Jesus himself said, the poor you have with you always. It's okay if you're poor. I've been that way all my life. It's all right. You can have a good life. <laughs> you know, the rich man has a problem. The rich man's problem is this. He thinks that's his answer. You can have peace and contentment and happiness and be much better off than the rich man. Many times you'll meet these men who have to always one-up you, and it's a constant conflict and turmoil, that's the business world. The business world is we've got to fight and constantly be getting better and better and stealing more and more, <laughs> more and more, you know, the political game. However, that's not a successful life. There's no joy in that. There's no peace and happiness. You know, many poor people have a lot more peace than rich men and vice versa. Not every poor man is happy. He's got to be willing to work. Now, you work because God puts it in your hand to do. You don't work because you're trying to make more coins. I tell you, that's a very disappointing life if you're trying to make coins. They make themselves wings and fly away. <laughs> so, be a poor lumberjack as long as you're listening to what God says to do.